If we're going to avoid being at the mercy of these world events, this country needs an all-out, all-of-the-above strategy that develops every available source of American energy. Perhaps the most dramatic discovery for the American energy picture in the last decade has been the, the ability to access the gas that's stored in the shales around the country. Not only do we have an abundance of natural gas being produced more than we expected, um, but the projections are that this is going to continue to rise. There's no question that shale has become very important to our overall energy supply picture. There are several reliable estimates that 50% of our daily gas supply will come from shale resources. So we have this, you know, great possibility of having, you know, cheaper electricity and, and the ability to sustain our economy and our economic growth with resources that are produced right here in the United States. So the downside to that is that if we don't do that correctly, uh, there can be environmental ramifications. There is so much emotion tied up in all of this. You know, one person says, oh, there's our energy independence. Some community that's living 20 miles away but is drinking the same water sees nothing but a threat. When you combine that with some genuine environmental concerns about the kind of drilling activity and the chemicals that are used and water issues and so forth, um, there are serious issues that have to be dealt with. A shale is a dense, um, low porosity, typically about 5 to 10 percent porosity. The pores of these rocks is what contains the hydrocarbons. That has very low permeability, which means fluids have a really hard time flowing through the shale. The problem is it's trapped in little chambers or little openings in the rock. How do you get that out? So what you do is you bring your rig to your surface location, right? So you're on top of the land. And the first thing you're going to do is drill vertically some distance. For the shale gas plays, it's usually about, oh, seven, eight thousand 8,000 feet, something like that. The first hole that's drilled is, is quite a wide diameter, and their surface casing is run in that hole and concreted between the casing and the, and the rock formation. Then later, when we drill several thousand feet more in the vertical well, intermediate casing is run, so there'll be another smaller set of casing run inside the first. After you reach your vertical depth that's desired, you would then go off uh, horizontally and place a lateral that's about four to 6,000 feet long. It's at that point that we will fracture the rock. People will pump down using water, typically, under high pressure, some kind of a material, usually sand, down into the casing. The, the sand will push through and force the shale to break up. The primary reason we use hydraulic fracturing is to ensure that we have sufficient contact area with the wellbore so that the gas or the oil can flow from the formation, from this kind of rock, to the wellbore. So basically the rock is being modified now by this hydraulic fracturing technique which makes all the shale revolution possible. The good news of natural gas is that it's domestic and relatively affordable and relatively clean, but at the same time that there's good news, there are environmental risks from its production, from the extraction of the natural gas. And those risks started with the surface, with the topographic disturbance. There's a drilling pad, about an acre in size, that is cleared of trees and grasses, and so that's a disturbance on the land. There are trucks that come and go with different equipment or different fluids for water for injection, that kind of thing, and those trucks take a toll with noise and air pollution. And then you bring up the gas along with all the fluids that you put in, plus other fluids that were naturally present. The other risk that I think is out there is the community risk. There is a massive impact as you have these activities essentially swoop into these communities. You have a large growth in employment, but that obviously creates strain on the social services. It creates strain on the infrastructure, the road, the sewage, the power generation. And all of these issues create a massive community challenge that needs to be thought about and proactively managed. A lot of this is happening in parts of the country 
that aren't used to large-scale energy development or even to large-scale industrial development. And so you have challenges in the local communities that have to be handled properly. One of the major concerns with um, fracking and shale gas is the possibility that it's going to lead to contamination of drinking water, contamination of aquifers. Now, most of the time, the shale development and the, and the presence of hydrocarbons occurs at depths of 6,000 feet or below, whereas groundwater typically is found in shallower formations, typically a few hundred feet from the surface. And so the groundwater is separated from the hydrocarbon resource by thousands of feet of rock. And that really provides you the buffer that you need to ensure that any fluids that you inject into uh, the shale formation is not going to make its way into the groundwater. There have been instances, fortunately very rare, where uh, there have been problems with the uh, surface casing and intermediate casing. These are not instances where the fluids uh, that got into the groundwater came up through thousands of feet of rock into the groundwater. It's a case where there was a problem with the casing right where it went through the groundwater, in other words, in the upper few hundred feet of a well bore. That's uh, obviously a problem and needs to be mitigated and prevented. Some of the most important things is to make sure that when you set your casing and you cement your casing, uh, you know, that you do a good job doing that. Because invariably, a lot of the blowouts that we have relate to mistakes made in setting the pipe that we put in there to protect it. And that comes to having, you know, tight standards for the cement that I use for the casing, right? That has to do with what kind of fluids I can use when I drill. These chemicals should be disclosed to the public so that there is no controversy or question in the public's mind about what kind of chemicals are being injected in the subsurface. In Texas, for example, in 2012, there's a law that's come into effect that requires operators to disclose on, in, a, in a written format, what kind of chemicals are being used in a particular fracturing process. There are a lot of companies that have experimented with coming up with non-toxic fluids. We know that's possible, actually. So let's do it. Drilling needs water, lots of water. To drill one hydrofracking well, you're gonna need about five million gallons of water. Now most of that water comes back up to the surface where it's come now contaminated with salts, uh, heavy metals, and other toxicants. That water is typically stored in ponds, but it has a great potential to uh, drain and impact either groundwater or surface water. So if we put them into a pond at the surface, we have to line that pond so the pollutants don't trickle back down to the water aquifer. So we have to be very careful that we, while getting our energy resources that are so valuable, don't accidentally contaminate another resource that's even more valuable, which is water. A lot of times uh, we do these operations in areas where water is scarce, in semi-arid areas. And that creates a, a serious problem in that it contributes to exacerbating water scarcity. And it represents a missed opportunity for adding value to the wastewater that we have just produced. For example, treated or desalinated to a level that whereas it may not be fit for human consumption, it might be good enough for irrigating salt tolerant plants or even to grow food. There are other risks. One of them that is uh, been reported recently is that some of this hydrofracking may induce some seismic activity, uh, more precisely small tremors and earthquakes. But the earthquakes aren't really induced by the hydraulic fracturing, they're induced by the reinjection wells. So when you do shale gas production, you have a lot of water to deal with at the end of the process. And the question becomes, what do you do with it? In some places, you can reinject the water into an aquifer. In Texas, we've been doing it for decades with no problem, really. If you reinject that water at a fault, you can actually induce an earthquake. So there is seismic activity that happens with hydraulic fracturing, but it's not because of the hydraulic fracturing it's because of the reinjection wells, which can be many miles away from your actual site of production. We can keep those risks to be very small. And that's really determined by identifying the right geological formation to reinject the water so it's safe. The industry has come a long ways in terms of minimizing its water footprint in the development of unconventional resources. In the past, we needed freshwater supplies for fracturing fluids. 
in the last few years, two or three years, it's now possible to actually use brackish water or saline water. And that's reduced the consumption of fresh water in hydraulic fracturing quite dramatically. And our thinking or trying to move towards what we call a zero discharge paradigm. In other words, recognize that pollution, in this case water, can be a resource. Hold it and recycle it and reuse it. Treat it so that it is good enough to be reinjected into the formation to make more wells, or perhaps treat it to a better, higher level to remove the salt so that it could be useful for irrigation. In that case, it would be a beneficial disposition of the water. All of these risks are real, they're non-trivial, but they're also manageable risks. They're all risks that we can deal with if we're willing to take the time and the effort to line our pits, to minimize the number of trucks we need on the roads, to case our wells so that when we go through the water table, the risk of contaminating the water is very small. We have a lot of experience at this point with what works and what doesn't, and it's important that industry use the best practices that are out there in order to avoid harm to local communities. But we're also going to need to go beyond voluntary measures. We are going to need robust government oversight of what's happening, both because substantively it matters, but also because people need to be reassured. And the company's words are not going to be enough to reassure them uh, by themselves. The fact that this resource is worth so much money is a great opportunity for all of us. It means there's an incentive economically to get it out of the ground and sell it to us and get it to market. So this is good news. Industry wants to produce this resource. So we can use that economic incentive as a part of the regulatory framework to encourage the right kind of behavior. And then out of that, you can look at the existing practices. Where are the gaps? Are there any gaps? Um, who has the best practice out there? And if those rules aren't common in every place, and this is one of the problems, I mean, states that have oil and gas industries, have had oil and gas industries for a long time, have pretty reasonable rules. States that are new to the game don't. So what you have to do is help the places that don't have good rules to get those rules. A lot of people view it as a, a, a black and white. Either there is some environmental risk to drilling, so we shouldn't do it, or we need the energy, so we, we just have to live with the risk. And you know, my point of view is, you know, no, I don't accept either of those positions. So I need to require that the technology be developed to the point where it mitigates in the highest possible manner the environmental risk of drilling. The way we're going to work ourselves through this is through a robust, transparent conversation that's bringing science and citizens and industry and responsible government to a place where there can be some degree of consensus. There's a real upside to figuring out a way to go forward with shale gas. Natural gas has the potential to provide a real bridge for where we are today to where we need to be in 50 or 60 years from now, hopefully, using a fuel that is at least cleaner and apparently now it can be relatively abundant.